Welcome, law buffs. How are you this afternoon? At least we didn't have an 8 a.m. start. Uh, my name is Georgette Vigil. I'm the Senior Director for Alumni Engagement and Outreach. And I must say, as the Alumni Director, it is very exciting to see so many people come out before a barbecue and uh, you know, football game to talk about the serious topic of ethics this afternoon. So welcome everyone. Um, homecoming has had this long tradition of ethics. I don't know how many years. Does anybody in the audience know how many years this has been happening? Mark? Nope, a long time. Okay. Um, all of you should have, when you came in, you received uh, the about the speaker, so you can read all about Dave Stark. But I can tell you from my experience in knowing Dave, he is a proud double buff. He's a law alumni board member, uh, and he is the chair of the law alumni board. And we are very pleased to have him here today for the second time presenting on ethics. So I will turn it over uh, to Dave Stark. Thank you. Well, I see that I'm the only one here that's wearing a, co a coat, you know? <laughs> Sorry about that. But I'm also the only one that doesn't have to wear a mask. So that's a good deal, I think. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see all of you here. I doubt that you're here because of the speaker. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're here because of the buffs, given their record, um, but I'm sure that, that you're all here for ethics credits. Uh, you get 1.8. I don't know why you only get 1.8. How are you gonna get 0.2? You know, uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I may be one of the only people here that doesn't need ethics credits. Another one over 72, there you go. All right, and, uh, and so uh, I don't have to worry about it. Everybody else here, except for the gentleman in the back, um, needs them. And so that's why we're here. Um, uh, one disclaimer before I start, and that is that uh, uh, what I say here today uh, uh, is my own views, uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, speak on behalf of the Colorado Supreme Court or the Colorado Access to Justice Commission or the law school. Uh, these are my own, my own thoughts, my own ideas, and my own views. Uh, so today we're going to talk about access to justice. Uh, it's uh, one of my passionate interests. Uh, I was talking to Mark Fogg before we got started, and we were talking about how long uh, he and I have both been working on access to justice issues, and uh, it, goes, it goes back quite a ways. Um, uh, these, this uh, access to justice issue, though, is a very important issue. And it is one of the issues, I think, that is leading to the uh, equality gap in the country. Uh, it's also leading to uh, the sense that people have uh, less faith in our institutions and less faith in our government. Uh, and so uh, I think for that reason, uh, this is an important topic that we should uh, be talking about. So we're going to examine what access to justice means uh, and what it, what it is to our fer fellow countrymen and, and uh, women. Um, we're going to talk about what led to this crisis. Uh, we'll talk about the people that have access to justice, uh, the people that don't, uh, and the people that need it, uh, and finally, how we might uh, resolve this justice gap, what we might do to fix it. Uh, I'm gonna leave some time for Q&A at the end, but if you have questions along the way, uh, please feel free to ask them. This is not a speech, uh, this is a discussion. Uh, and so if you wanna ask a question, just say so. Uh, Georgette has a microphone that uh, she can uh, give you and, uh, and we can talk about it. Um, uh, also, uh, if, uh, if you're uh, doing this virtually, uh, and I, I believe that uh, some of you are, uh, feel free to post a question in the chat and uh, we'll take a look at the chat uh, and try to answer that. So 
Uh, with that, let's uh, get started. Um, first of all, what is access to justice? Um, you know, uh, I, I think that there are, are a number of definitions. Uh, a definition that was given to me by Bob Glaves, who's the executive director of the Chicago Bar Foundation, uh, who has been heavily involved in access to justice issues for, for a, a very long time, uh, describes it this way. Uh, uh, it is a, a person or entity that needs uh, uh, some assistance with a legal issue. The legal issue might be something for that person's benefit, or it might be something that would hurt them. Um, uh, it is the appropriate level of assistance uh, that, uh, that uh, the person has uh, to get a fair and efficient court or process uh, to resolve the disputes so that that person can understand uh, and make decisions about their legal issue. And they feel like they've been heard and they feel like they've been treated fairly uh, and, uh, and they feel like they've been understood. Uh, that's access to justice. And so I, I think that you'll see as we go along, access to justice uh, is a lot more than just uh, having a lawyer at your side. Um, uh, it is a continuum, uh, and uh, that continuum uh, is uh, best described this way, I think. Uh, so we start out uh, with, uh, with legal information, and that's, that's something that, that everyone needs. It doesn't necessarily come from a lawyer. Uh, it might come from a website. It might come from uh, our court system. Uh, in Colorado, we have something... Uh, that was uh, developed uh, about 10 years ago, uh, and it's the Sherlock system. Sherlocks are self-represented litigant coordinators, uh, and they are located in every district court uh, in Colorado. Uh, there are generally two in every district court, and they are there to provide legal information. They don't give legal advice, but they have forms. They can explain court processes. Uh, and they are, they are available to answer questions uh, for folks that come to the courthouse and, uh, frankly, have no idea what they should do. In 2019, uh, Sherlock's uh, serviced 168,000 people in Colorado. Uh, that's how important the Sherlock's are. Uh, and, uh, and I think every year the, the number of folks that are... Uh, are assisted by Sherlock's uh, uh, is, uh, is, is increasing. Uh, a, second, a second part of the continuum is legal advice. Uh, a clinics, clinics that people can go to. Uh, Metro Volunteer Lawyers, for example, in Denver is one. Uh, there are others around the state that have clinics uh, that uh, might meet uh, once a week or, or maybe once a month. Uh, then there's, uh, there's actual legal representation. And uh, uh, with actual legal representation, we're talking about uh, a number of uh, different kinds of folks that provide legal representation. One, obviously, is lawyers, but uh, we have others as well. We have, uh, we have navigators. Uh, navigators is a program that is a pilot program that started in Adams County. Uh, and the navigators there are senior citizens uh, that uh, have chosen to volunteer their services to act as mediators in eviction cases. Uh, these are cases where neither side has a lawyer. So the landlord doesn't have a lawyer and the tenant doesn't have a lawyer. And these folks um, uh, are there to help in mediating the dispute. This is something that originated in New York. Uh, and uh, has been quite successful uh, back there. Uh, and uh, we learned of it uh, through one of the judges in New York coming out to speak to us. And uh, we decided that uh, this might be a great idea for Colorado. And so uh, uh, Adams County uses it. We, uh, we, uh, we tried it for a time in Breckenridge. Uh, and, uh, but as of right now, we just have Adams County. Um, we also have uh, licensed paraprofessionals. Uh, this is something that you're going to hear a lot more about. Uh, 
later on in my talk. Uh, licensed paraprofessionals are people that are not lawyers, but that provide legal advice on a limited basis. Uh, this is something that is happening across the country. Uh, we have been working on it in Colorado since 2016. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, it is uh, a movement that uh, uh, has taken hold uh, in many different places. Uh, finally, we have, uh, we have folks that uh, are first responders and other, uh, other community uh, type uh, providers. Uh, now, you wouldn't think that those people would necessarily uh, be on this continuum, but they are. And they are there and, uh, and oftentimes have legal information, have advice, uh, can uh, explain where a person might get uh, certain benefits from the government and so forth. Uh, so they're on the continuum as well. So where are we today? The, the current state of play uh, is that access to justice, uh, regrettably, is in a crisis. Uh, and we have something called the uh, justice gap. Um, you know, our, our, uh, our, uh, our profession uh, was granted a license to practice law, and we've been given a monopoly. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to, to guard that monopoly carefully if we want to use it that way. Uh, but uh, we also have to keep in mind that the country was founded on the principle of equal justice under law. Uh, our oath of admission um, uh, says that I will never reject from any consideration personal to myself the cause of the defenseless or the oppressed. Rule 6.1 of the Rules of Professional Conduct says that every lawyer has a professional obligation to provide legal services to those unable to pay. And a lawyer should aspire to render at least 50 hours of pro bono service each year. Uh, finally, the, the preamble to the uh, Rules of Professional Conduct says that all lawyers should devote professional time and resources and use civic influence to ensure equal access to our system of justice for all those who, because of economic or social barriers, cannot afford to secure uh, uh, adequate legal counsel. Um, so uh, we, we, have, we have a crisis uh, now, uh, the problem here, of course, is that the right to counsel uh, in civil proceedings is rare. Uh, you generally uh, do not have the right to counsel, and this leaves most people without a lawyer uh, when they stand on the brink of eviction, uh, when they are the victims of consumer fraud, uh, or are forced to deal with uh, the numerous uh, potentially uh, life-changing events that, uh, that we all go through from time to time. And while the, the Constitution guarantees uh, the right to counsel for someone accused of a crime, uh, that counsel may not have sufficient time or resources to provide a robust representation. And the result uh, from all of these things is an unmistakable justice gap. Uh, this justice gap is felt by by tens of millions of people uh, that are American citizens. Uh, it's uh, especially felt in uh, communities of color and in low income communities. Um, and you might wonder, well, you know, this can't be that many people. Uh, the, the statistics show us that there are probably 60% of the folks that live in the United States that fall into the justice gap. These are 60% that uh, don't qualify for legal aid and yet can't afford a lawyer. Uh, they, uh, these are folks that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, may, may try to represent themselves. They are many folks that uh, don't even realize that they have a legal problem. Uh, and uh, most of them simply cannot afford uh, uh, a, uh, 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 to represent themselves, cannot afford a lawyer uh, at any price. Uh, so the justice system is out of reach. 
uh, and uh, and the uh, the market is broken. Um, and yet, we have many many lawyers that are struggling uh, to make ends meet. Uh, they are struggling in their practices. Uh, you know, not every lawyer uh, is uh, charging a thousand dollars an hour. Uh, not every lawyer is uh, is making. Uh, uh, a first-year salary of $180,000 a year. Some are, uh, but uh, those are few and far between. And the average lawyer uh, in Colorado uh, is making much less than that, probably under $100,000 a year. So uh, how do we match up the lawyers uh, who need work with clients who need help? Um, uh, and that's one of the things that we want to talk about today. So how did this happen? Where did we get to this point? Uh, well, first of all, we have no civil Gideon. Uh, everybody's familiar with Gideon versus Wainwright. It was decided way back in the 60s. Uh, but uh, there is no civil Gideon. Uh, lots of people think that there should be, but, uh, but we don't have it. We do have the Legal Services Corporation, but their funding is, is really quite low. Uh, and uh, for comparison, uh, let's look at the criminal system. And in Colorado, let me find my, uh, my, uh, my notes. Okay, in Colorado, Colorado Legal Services has 75 lawyers that serve the state. The public defender has 535 lawyers that serve the state. Now, there's something wrong with that equation. Uh, how can it be that we only provide money for 75 lawyers on the civil side uh, and yet 535 on the criminal side? Um, that, uh, that's something that, uh, that needs fixing. Um, so who's responsible for this? Well, uh, uh, regrettably, I think, uh, there are a number of folks that, uh, that might be responsible. But uh, the truth is that all of us are. Uh, and so let's, let's take a look at those that have access to justice. Um, first, uh, wealthy individuals, that top 1%, uh, probably not anybody here. Um, corporations, uh, uh, those that have legal budgets. Uh, how many people here have a legal budget? Anybody? I don't have one. Nobody has one. Of course not. Uh, the people that have legal budgets, uh, big corporations, uh, businesses sometimes, um, uh, they have access to justice. They have access to lawyers and they use them. Uh, there are some personal injury plaintiffs that, uh, that also uh, have uh, have access to justice, but they have to be plaintiffs that uh, are involved in in a matter that has substantial damages, and the defendant must have assets or insurance sufficient to satisfy uh, a uh, judgment. Otherwise, no one's going to take it on a contingent fee basis, uh, and of course, these personal injury plaintiffs uh, are not going to be able to. Uh, to uh, pay a lawyer uh, on an hourly basis. Um, those that qualify for legal aid uh, may also have access to justice. Uh, but legal aid, uh, uh, the general qualifications are that you must make less than 125% of the poverty level. Uh, anybody know what that is? Well, for a family of four, the poverty level is $32,000. So. Uh, the, the, the person would have to make under $32,000, assuming that they have, they have uh, a partner and two children. Um, Colorado Legal Services can only serve 50% of the people that come to them. Uh, why? Because they simply don't have the resources. Um, uh, as I said before, they have 75 lawyers. They do a great job. They work hard. John Asher. Uh, has been the executive director of uh, Colorado Legal Services for almost as long as I've been practicing, and uh, he is uh, he is a great lawyer and a and a and a great uh, 
uh, ambassador for access to justice, but uh, they simply don't have, they don't have enough resources to serve all the people that need it. Um, there are uh, about 750,000 people uh, in Colorado that qualify for legal aid. Uh, and uh, you can see 75 lawyers just isn't going to cut it. Uh, finally, those that are insured may have access to justice. Uh, but uh, that assumes that, uh, that they have uh, the right kind of insurance, that they have sufficient insurance uh, that will cover uh, the, uh, the issue. Uh, and uh, so some will and, and some will not. So who needs access to justice? Well, uh, I, I think I've, I've outlined that pretty well, but uh, let's talk about that. First of all, persons of limited means, that is uh, those folks that, that, uh, that do qualify for legal aid. And as I mentioned, legal aid turns away uh, about uh, 50% uh, of, uh, of those folks uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, apply. Um, Self-represented litigants. Uh, Self-represented litigants make up a huge portion of, of, of uh, people that, uh, that we see in the courthouse every day. These are people that are involved in some type of litigation and they have chosen to represent themselves. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment, but um, uh, self-represented litigants make up a, a, a large portion. Uh, people making 200 to 400 percent of the poverty level, um, uh, these are people that are in the middle class. Uh, these are people that make, uh, some of them make over $100,000 a year. Uh, but still, these are folks that cannot afford lawyers at market rates. Uh, legal deserts. Uh, legal deserts are, are uh, another issue that we, we see, uh, especially in Colorado, but really all around the country. And, and these, are, these are places where there simply aren't any lawyers. Uh, usually it's rural. Uh, in, in, uh, in Colorado, for example, Denver County has 42% of the registered Colorado lawyers, Denver County. Uh, but there are many counties in Colorado, most of them clustered in the south uh, and in the eastern part of the state, that have few or no attorneys. Uh, there are 21 counties in Colorado that have fewer than 10 lawyers. Now. If you think about that for a minute, now wait a minute. So some of those lawyers are judges. Some of those lawyers are county attorneys. Some of them may be prosecutors. When you get right down to it, there may be very, very few people uh, that are available to provide, provide any kind of legal service, let alone pro bono service. Um, uh, earlier, uh, I'm trying to think it was this year. I think it was, the, it was last year. Uh, I got a call from uh, a county court judge in Dolores County. Now, Dolores is way down uh, in the southwestern corner of the state. Uh, and he was looking for help. He wanted to know if I could help him to find lawyers that could uh, represent folks in eviction cases. Uh, and I said, well, you know, uh, uh, perhaps uh, you can get the County Bar Association together and they can uh, put together a task force and, uh, and they, can, uh, they can help these folks that need, uh, that need uh, uh, eviction help. Um, and he explained to me that there just aren't enough lawyers there. I think he said there were eight lawyers in Dolores County. Well, you know, that's just, that's just impossible. Uh, not only do, do those lawyers not have the ability probably to, to provide a lot of pro bono work, but uh, you wonder if they have the ability to provide work at all. Um, so um, uh, we have legal deserts. We also have cases that are too small for contingent fees. Um, you know, a contingent fee case uh, must have substantial damages. It must have uh, some type of of uh, insurance or other 
other assets available to pay a judgment. Uh, and there are many, many cases that, uh, that don't fall into that category. I, I was talking with, with a lawyer that handles lawyer malpractice cases. Uh, and uh, I know that's not a that's not a great subject, but uh, he was telling me about all the cases that he turns down. Uh, now, uh, he won't take a case uh, on a contingent fee basis uh, unless uh, the the case is going to be worth three times one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Why is that? Because it, it, it's going to cost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to prosecute that case. And that's that's a uh, bargain basement. Um, uh, and so there are many folks that have uh, that have uh, uh, some type of uh, claim, whether it be a lawyer claim, a doctor claim uh, or whatever it might be, that simply can't get uh, access to justice because the claim is not sufficient. Um, so what uh, what kinds of problems are we talking about uh, with these folks? I mentioned uh, I mentioned self-represented litigants uh, in uh, in domestic relations cases uh, in Colorado. Seventy-five percent of all the parties have no lawyer. I don't know if any of you do domestic relations work, but um, I'm sure that if you do. You've seen all these self-represented litigants. Uh, and, uh, and the Colorado Supreme Court expressed a lot of concern about self-represented litigants uh, a number of years ago. Debt collection, um, uh, county court debt collection cases. Uh, almost all of the people uh, sued in county court for debt collection have no lawyer, 95%. Um, uh, in eviction and housing, 95% um, of the respondents have no lawyer. Um, uh, the landlord's counsel run the courtroom. Uh, has anybody been to, uh, to an eviction courtroom where they have returns? Anybody been to one of those? So uh, I think you, you can confirm that the way that that works, of course, is that, that uh, counsel for the landlords, they set up shop in the courtroom. They have a table right here, and there's no judge. And the clerk uh, is sitting up there in the front, and they set up shop. They don't really make it clear about who they represent. Some people think that they're, uh, they're uh, an independent mediator. Other people think that maybe they're their lawyer. Uh, but uh, the point is that, uh, that they run the courtroom. Uh, and these folks, simply don't have uh, access to justice. Uh, uh, the, the many studies have shown that uh, people that do have lawyers in eviction cases, about half of them uh, are able to resolve the matter uh, without an eviction judgment. Now, why is an eviction judgment uh, so important? Um, if, if you get evicted uh, and the court enters a judgment, that goes into a database. Uh, and landlords have access to that database. And if you have an eviction judgment, the landlord isn't going to rent to you uh, for the next apartment or house or whatever it is that, that you might want. So having a, having a lawyer uh, uh, in an eviction case can be critically important, even if there isn't much of a defense. And of course, in Colorado, we don't have many defenses in eviction cases. We don't have the implied warranty of habitability uh, that, uh, that many of the eastern states have. Uh, employment issues are, are another, another uh, source of, uh, of uh, lack of access to justice. Uh, uh, often people have issues with regard to employment, and, uh, and they simply try to go it alone. Uh, they don't have the, the uh, wherewithal. They don't have the money uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to hire someone to help them. <clears throat> so, what are the consequences then of this uh, of this justice gap? Um, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System, IELTS, um, 
just uh, finished a uh, justice needs report. IELTS is an independent organization located at DU, uh, and, uh, and IELTS uh, is national in scope. Uh, it, uh, it teamed up with the uh, Hague Institute of Innovation and Law uh, to uh, create this uh, needs report, and they surveyed over 10,000 people across the U.S. Uh, uh, from, from all walks of life and from all income levels. Uh, this was done in 2020, and what they found was that, uh, uh, of course, as you might imagine, the cri crisis is not evenly distributed. Uh, lower income, women, uh, middle-aged people all have uh, the more serious legal problems, and uh, they resolve them at lower rates. Uh, black Americans and Americans that live in urban environments uh, uh, have, uh, uh, have that as well. Um, uh, this crisis um, uh, negatively impacts all of us, uh, regardless of uh, our income, regardless of our status. 66% uh, of the folks in the United States uh, had a legal issue in the past four years. Many of them didn't even realize they had the issue. Uh, only two-thirds of those problems were resolved at all. 44% um, uh, who experience a legal problem uh, reported negative consequences. Uh, and the most commonly experienced problems, of course, are consumer uh, debt issues, personal injury, property damage, uh, neighbor problems, unemployment, and crime. Um, I also mentioned that, uh, that these folks do not have the ability to hire a lawyer at market rates. Uh, and in fact, uh, a Federal Reserve study that's done every year uh, shows that uh, for most of the folks in the United States, uh, they could not survive a $400 financial crisis. Uh, a busted refrigerator or a traffic accident or, God forbid, a DUI uh, is simply beyond their capacity to handle. Um, they get a DUI, they, they, can't, they can't afford uh, $1,500 or whatever the cut rate might be. Uh, for a DUI, and so what do they do? They go it alone, uh, or they try to get a public defender. Um, so um, access to justice is, uh, is indeed a broad social problem uh, with, with a big impact. Uh, and some of the effects uh, on, the, on the system are a lack of trust, uh, as I said before, uh, a lack of faith in the system, um, uh, Self-represented litigants, uh, frankly, gum up the works. Ask any judge uh, that handles domestic cases how they like self-represented litigants, uh, and they will tell you, we don't. Uh, we try to be patient, we try to help them, uh, but uh, it, is, it is something that simply slows down the process. Um, so um, that's where we are today. So what can we do to fix it? Well, I think number one, we can recognize uh, the uh, crisis and it affects its effects on the rule of law. Um, you know, if there is uh, no equal access to justice, then we have to find uh, some solutions uh, that, uh, that will change that. We have to recognize the power and the strength of the rule of law. Uh, it's uh, Judge Mach uh, from the U.S. District Court in Denver used to say that uh, the rule of law is what keeps us from taking to the streets with pitchforks or otherwise. Um, uh, the, uh, the rule of law promotes confidence uh, in our judicial system and confidence in government. Uh, and it sets us apart from other nations. Uh, and from, uh, from other forms of government. Um, so these solutions uh, need to be standardized, uh, they need to be scalable, and they need to be economically viable. Um, 
They need to be uh, user-centered design. That is that uh, it has to be focused on the users. That is the people that, that need the access to justice. So uh, there are solutions in play. Uh, and, uh, and the first one I want to talk about is licensed legal paraprofessionals, LLPs. Uh, this is a market-based approach that allows non-lawyers to provide legal services uh, to that portion of the client population that uh, doesn't qualify for legal aid but can't afford a lawyer at regular rates. Uh, this is, as I said before, this is a huge part of the legal market. Uh, and right now, it's being served by nobody. Um, uh, it, uh, it involves uh, the uh, self-represented litigants uh, and others with legal problems who try to go it alone because they don't have any alternative. Uh, and so around the country, we see a movement uh, for this type of uh, limited legal representation. Uh, Washington State was really the first state to, uh, to adopt this. They called their, their folks triple LTs, um, limited licensed legal technicians. Uh, uh, that program lasted for about 10 years, uh, but uh, regrettably their, their Supreme Court in, uh, in Washington State is elected, uh, not appointed. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the uh, majority on the court shifted, uh, and uh, uh, by a close vote, the, the court uh, voted to sunset the triple LT program. The triple LT program was set up to allow uh, these licensed legal technicians to provide services in a number of different categories, including evictions, uh, domestic relations, debt collection, things of that sort. Um, now, the folks that, uh, that promoted the triple LT program in Washington State, they haven't given up yet. Uh, they, are, they are still, uh, still pursuing it. They're hopeful that they can change the minds of the folks in the uh, Washington State Bar Association uh, and thus change the minds of the justices on the Washington Supreme Court. Uh, another state is Utah. Uh, Utah is probably the poster child right now for, uh, for these licensed uh, legal paraprofessionals. Uh, and in Utah, uh, Utah uh, has employed a sandbox system. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what a sandbox is, but right now uh, Utah has, has their system up and running. Uh, and they use an independent regulator to monitor uh, the type of programs that are being offered there. Uh, it is evidence-based and risk-based regulation. Uh, and uh, the folks that are providing these services uh, have to provide data regularly to the regulator. Um, uh, so let me give you an example of a, uh, of a uh, of a system that, uh, that we're talking about. And this would be, again, for, uh, for uh, sandboxes. So the, the idea of a sandbox is to give uh, folks the opportunity to experiment uh, and to innovate with different types of legal, uh, legal representation. Uh, these are folks that are licensed. Uh, they're required to take an exam. They're required to uh, to satisfy educational requirements. Uh, they have ethics rules, uh, and uh, uh, they have all of the, the, the same obligations that lawyers have, but they're only allowed to, uh, to handle certain uncomplicated matters uh, and uh, matters that, uh, that don't uh, pose a danger uh, to uh, legal consumers. Um, uh, so that's Utah. Uh, they use, like I say, they use the sandbox. Uh, Arizona is another one. Arizona uh, has uh, eliminated Rule 5.4. Uh, Rule 5.4 says that uh, uh, you can't share legal fees with a non-lawyer. It also says that, that a non-lawyer can't own an interest in a law firm. 
Well, Arizona decided uh, there was no good reason for that, and so they did away with, with uh, 5.4. And so now uh, there, are, there are certain organizations and individuals that have decided uh, to invest in law firms in Arizona. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see how that turns out. Um, uh, Colorado, uh, in Colorado, we have been working on a program for licensed legal paraprofessionals since uh, 2016. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, has now approved a preliminary report uh, for, uh, for this type of program and has, uh, has ordered that uh, the advisory committee uh, for the Colorado Supreme Court uh, attorney regulation system uh, create an implementation plan. Uh, and this, this implementation plan is something that, that uh, 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 now uh, we are working on. And I, I happen to be part of that. Um, uh, this is for uncomplicated, low asset divorce cases. Uh, divorce cases would, which have uh, under $200,000 in net marital assets. Uh, these folks, uh, as I said before, would have to be licensed. Uh, they would uh, be licensed by the Colorado Supreme Court. Uh, they would have to satisfy an experiential requirement, 1,500 hours uh, of work uh, in, the, in the legal profession, uh, with at least 500 uh, in domestic relations work. Uh, they would uh, they would also have uh, have to take certain classes uh, from uh, uh, community colleges or uh, or universities uh, to uh, satisfy the educational requirement, uh, and then uh, finally they would uh, they would have to take. The, I'm sorry, my I wasn't able to figure out how to turn my phone off, so. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I have to talk to that guy later. Um, sorry about that. Um, so this this program, uh, the uh, uh, we call it our uh, uh, LLP program, uh, is designed uh, to cater to that seventy five percent of self represented litigants in domestic cases. Just a second. There, okay, sorry. Uh, that guy wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, so anyhow, it's, so it's to cater to those folks that, that try to represent themselves in, in domestic relations cases. Uh, and so now we have four working groups that we've developed. Uh, one uh, is to uh, create uh, a detailed uh, educational and experiential and examination requirement for licensure. Uh, another uh, is working on uh, court rules and uh, and statutes that might have to be either created or modified. Uh, for example, if we're going to have these folks, they're, they're going to need to uh, uh, have some type of a privilege. So we may need to uh, we may need to have ask the legislature to uh, to modify uh, Title Title 13 with regard to attorney-client privilege to provide some type of a privilege for these folks as well. Um, uh, we also uh, uh, have a group working on a kind of the nuts and bolts of the judicial system. Um, what will it take uh, to uh, to make changes to the electronic filing uh, system that we have so that these folks can can electronically file. And then finally, we have a, we have a working group that is working on outreach uh, and education to stakeholders. Uh, and uh, uh, these stakeholders would include lawyers, uh, judges, uh, and the general public. Uh, and so this is, this is something that, uh, that I say, as I say, we've been working on this for, for a number of years. Uh, the, this most recent iteration uh, was uh, given preliminary approval by the court last year. We hope to have something to the court for its consideration uh, by the end of next year. Uh, 
Um, there are other states that are doing this as well. Uh, California, uh, for example, uh, is, is working on uh, a, the, a paraprofessional program. Illinois has already, oops. Sorry, we need to, my, my computer times out every so often. One second here. This is kind of like uh, somebody saying uh, you're on mute, right? Um, as I said, uh, we have uh, now we have other states that are doing this as well. California, Illinois, Minnesota has already adopted uh, a program there. Now in Minnesota, uh, these folks must work at a law firm. Uh, in the proposal that, uh, that we have in Colorado, uh, these folks could either work at a law firm or they could work independently. They could, they could set up their own shop. Uh, North Carolina uh, has, uh, has started down this road as well. The Canadian provinces, a number of the Canadian provinces have been in this business for many years, and they have had uh, limited license paraprofessionals providing legal work uh, for quite a while. Uh, in, in England and the UK, uh, same thing. They have uh, adopted this system as well. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, most of them are, uh, are using uh, sandboxes. Um, so, um, uh, these, uh, these sandboxes are designed to, uh, uh, to of course, uh, uh, give folks, uh, the option of, uh, of using, uh, innovative, uh, changes that, uh, that will help to resolve the, the, uh, the justice gap. Okay. Yeah. Are not supervised by attorneys. What happens uh, when the uncomplicated matter gets complicated and they are in their hands? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And the answer is that these these uh, LLPs, uh, one of their one of their uh, rules of professional conduct would be that they have an obligation to bring in a lawyer as soon as the matter uh, gets beyond their their expertise, either because all of a sudden they, they find out, oh, there's a, there's a trust involved, uh, there's some kind of retirement plan involved, uh, or, or something of that sort. And so if they have that, if, if that comes to pass, then, you know, they've got an obligation to uh, tell the client we need to bring in a lawyer, right? Uh, and, and I think it's that way in, in nearly every state uh, right now. Now, there are some states, as I say, um, like Minnesota, where they have to be under the supervision of a lawyer. Uh, but I think there are, there, uh, most of the other ones, uh, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to have to be uh, represented by counsel or not, not, they won't have to be supervised by a lawyer. Dave, we have a question yeah. from online. Uh, the question is from Sean Owens. He asks, has anyone studied and articulated the economic impact of lack of access to justice? Well, I think there are, there are a number of studies that have been done. Uh, I think if we dig deep into the study that I talked about that was done by IELTS and the, and the Hague Institute, uh, we can find that. I think there are some other folks that have that have uh, have done those studies. Uh, Rebecca Sandifer is one that uh, that has uh, written extensively uh, on this, and uh, and so I don't have that uh, at uh, uh, at my fingertips, but I'm confident that that uh, that studies have been done. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, uh, you might think that this is uh, th this idea of uh, 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 limited uh, 
uh, licensed paraprofessionals is a radical change. Uh, but in fact, um, it's not. Uh, even in Colorado, uh, there are many things uh, that people can do in terms of rendering legal service and legal advice um, that are uh, that do not require a lawyer. Uh, so in Colorado, the practice of law is defined as acting as a representative uh, or acting in a representative capacity and protecting, enforcing, or defending legal rights and duties of another and in counseling, uh, advising and assisting another in connection with these rights and duties. Uh, and this is, this is uh, from an opinion by the, the Colorado Supreme Court. But when it can be established that uh, uh, Colorado consumers are protected, uh, the, uh, the court uh, has allowed uh, non-lawyers uh, to get into the business. Uh, the best example, of course, is real estate agents. Real estate agents are allowed to draft contracts um, and, uh, and uh, close real estate transactions. Uh, no lawyer is required. Now, if you were in New Jersey, uh, you'd have to have a lawyer. Pennsylvania, you'd have to have a lawyer. Colorado, not so. Um, uh, there are others. Uh, unemployment compensation hearings in Colorado don't require a lawyer. Uh, Public Utilities Commission hearings don't require a lawyer. Immigration uh, uh, proceedings don't require a lawyer. And also, uh, many, many federal agencies uh, allow non-lawyers to appear and represent someone uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, providing uh, legal, uh, legal advice. So, uh, some, uh, some other solutions that are in play as well uh, when we get past the uh, limited licensed legal uh, professionals, uh, incubators. Uh, incubators uh, is, is something else that, uh, that we have uh, started in Colorado. Uh, we have uh, uh, legal entrepreneurs for justice in Colorado. And uh, this is a, uh, a program that provides training and mentoring uh, and uh, resources and support for lawyers that, uh, that want to go a different way, that want to establish uh, their own solo practice uh, and to provide a type of public service practice uh, and yet make a decent living at it. Uh, these, are, these are lawyers that are committed to affordable pricing, to alternative pricing structures, uh, to flexible representation options to uh, unbundled services uh, and uh, uh, for leveraging technology and innovation uh, as a way to provide legal service. Um, legal Entrepreneurs for Justice has, uh, has been up and running since uh, 2018. Uh, I, I think we're now in our sixth cohort uh, and uh, uh, the program uh, is is one that uh, that allows these these uh, lawyers. Not all of them are young. They might be people that have practiced for 20 years but want to go a different way. Uh, but they they are there. They are given the opportunity to learn how to run their own law firm. Uh, these folks might be from big law. They might be from the government. Uh, but they are given the training and mentoring to learn how to run a law firm. Uh, not just the, the legal aspects, but also the business aspects. Uh, this, uh, this is a 12-month program. Uh, it starts out with a boot camp uh, of, uh, of a week uh, of intense uh, training uh, and then uh, takes uh, these folks through 12 months of, uh, of mentoring and training. Uh, do they pay for this? Yes, they pay something. They get a discount. Uh, they pay $300 a month. Uh, for uh, the first portion and then $375 a month thereafter. What do they get for that? Uh, they get office space. Uh, now, they don't get their own office. They don't get their 8 by 12 office, but they do get office space at Law Bank. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Law Bank. Law Bank is a, a collaborative uh, service that provides um, uh, uh, 
each person with a desk, uh, with uh, copy machines, printers, uh, uh, conference rooms, um, a kitchen to, uh, to make coffee and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and so they get that uh, for uh, $300 a month. Uh, they they uh, provide their own malpractice insurance, uh, and they are assigned to a pro bono provider uh, for the first three months of their of their term. Uh, and during that time, they are uh, given the opportunity to shadow an experienced lawyer at a pro bono provider, shadow someone at Colorado Legal Services. Uh, or at uh, Metro Volunteer Lawyers, or at Alpine Legal Services in uh, uh, in uh, rural Colorado, uh, and so these folks are given that opportunity uh, once they once they complete uh, that pro bono program, uh, they then are pretty much on their own, uh, and they're they're uh, able to uh, to learn how to uh, create a law firm. And, uh, and to run one uh, and to be a success. Uh, and uh, this, this program uh, for the first couple of years was uh, a 501c3 uh, and was, uh, we were spending a great deal of our time uh, trying to raise money. Uh, recently, uh, the, uh, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court has agreed that uh, uh, legal entrepreneurs for justice can move into the Colorado Attorney Mentoring Program. And so now CAMP will, uh, will be uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the body that is, uh, that is running the program. And of course, Ryan Payton, who is the executive director of, of uh, CAMP, uh, is going to be the executive director of, uh, of LEJ. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, this is going to be uh, a great move, I think, for LEJ. Uh, we will have the first court-sponsored uh, legal incubator in the country, uh, and uh, and I think that uh, that this again is is something to help to solve the justice gap. Uh, who are these people? Who are these folks uh, in LEJ going to be serving? They're going to be serving the exact same folks that we were talking about before. It's those people in the justice gap, those people that don't qualify for legal aid, but can't afford a lawyer. Uh, these are folks that, uh, that are looking for a different method uh, of paying for a lawyer. It might be unbundled services. It might be a subscription basis. It might be a flat fee, uh, but uh, uh, it would be something other than hourly. Um, so uh, uh, ours is is not the uh, the only incubator program in the country. There are many others. Most of them are um, sponsored by law by law schools, uh, but uh, but uh, here it's going to be uh, sponsored by uh, by the court and by uh, by camp. There are other kinds of programs that we we see as well. Uh, some government programs. Uh, special immigration programs, uh, farm worker programs, uh, eviction programs uh, on a limited basis. Um, uh, and then we also have pro bono uh, service by practicing lawyers. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, Rule 6.1 um, uh, has uh, uh, provides us uh, the uh, responsibility or gives us the responsibility to provide, there we go again, to provide uh, 50 hours of pro bono uh, service per year uh, on the average. Um, uh, law firms and solo practitioners have, uh, have played a, an important part in fulfilling that aspirational uh, goal. Uh, also in-house lawyers uh, and government lawyers as well. Uh, the uh, uh, I bet you didn't know that the Colorado Attorney General's Office has a pro bono program, uh, and they they provide pro bono service. And that's, of course, uh, the Attorney General's Office is the largest legal organization in the state, uh, and they have been involved in providing uh, pro bono uh, for a number of years. Um, there are there are in-house lawyer programs as well, 
and uh, uh, the uh, the organization uh, that uh, that uh, uh, handles uh, in-house lawyer programs uh, has uh, has been very active uh, in in pro bono. Uh, there are many programs uh, for pro bono around the state, uh, but. Um, one of the problems that we have had in the past is that there are many of them, but oftentimes they're stepping on each other. Uh, and uh, and there, there is no one uh, central site uh, for lawyers to find pro bono opportunities. And there's no one central site for uh, clients to find uh, pro bono help. Well, now we have succession to service. And succession to service is Colorado's pro bono portal. Uh, and the goal of, the, of succession to service uh, is to establish a structured statewide platform for Colorado's lawyers and law students uh, to partner with nonprofit organizations uh, and courts and other legal service entities uh, to influence the continuing need for, uh, for equal access to justice. Uh, so, uh, Succession to Service started out as a program that was going to be just for retired and soon to be retired lawyers, thus the name Succession to Service. Uh, but uh, it was so successful that it has expanded now. And, and the idea is to match up lawyers and law students with uh, pro bono providers uh, that interest them. Uh, and so the way that it works is that a lawyer uh, would go to the Succession to Service website, uh, pick the kinds of cases that they're interested in or the kinds of transactions. Uh, it may be non-litigation. Uh, and they will then be, be uh, placed on a list uh, and uh, they will be able to, uh, to see who the pro bono providers are in that category. Uh, and uh, then if the lawyer wants a new pro bono matter, uh, the lawyer can then contact the pro bono provider uh, and say, sign me up. Uh, and now we've matched the lawyer and the pro bono provider. Uh, this, is a, this is a product of the Colorado Access to Justice Commission and its delivery committee. Uh, and uh, as I said, it, it began as a program just for retired lawyers or soon to be retired lawyers. Uh, but uh, then grew uh, into a much more comprehensive program. Um, now, how do we measure uh, the amount of pro bono service that is, that is being provided? Uh, and how do we promote more pro bono service? Um, uh, the statistics show that over the last 10 years, pro bono service has gone down uh, in Colorado. Uh, but how do we establish a baseline? How do we know how much pro bono is being done? Uh, right now, we really don't have a baseline. We don't know how to determine uh, the amount of pro bono that's being done. Uh, we have the Colorado Supreme Court Pro Bono Recognition Program, uh, and we can <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, look at that program to see how many firms have signed up for the program. Anybody here that uh, is, is involved in the pro bono recognition program? Okay. Um, what happens with the program is that you, you make a pledge at the beginning of the year that you or your firm is going to provide 50 hours of pro bono uh, uh, for uh, for the, for that particular year, and then if you meet that goal, uh, and someone will will c contact you and ask you if you met the goal, then you get a special asterisk. Uh, and uh, uh, each year, the Colorado Supreme Court then has a uh, uh, a pro bono recognition ceremony. Uh, in the in the past couple of years, of course, it's been virtual, uh, but. Uh, 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 you know, we're hoping that it will be uh, in person this coming year. Uh, so that's one way of checking. But the, uh, I'll tell you, the, uh, the number of, of lawyers and law firms and other organizations uh, participating in that program has gone down, not up. Um, and so 
Um, what do we do? How do we how do we establish uh, this this uh, this program? Uh, how do we determine um, uh, the amount of pro bono that we have? And and so then how do we decide how to promote it and increase it? Uh, one possible method is mandatory or voluntary reporting of pro bono work. Um, now, right now, there are nine states in the U.S. that have mandatory reporting of pro bono. Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Maryland, Mississippi, Nevada, uh, New York, and New Mexico. Uh, there are 13 other states that have voluntary pro bono reporting. Uh, and, uh, of course, we don't have that in Colorado right now. Um, uh, now, uh, the idea, uh, I think, with regard to these states that have it, is that uh, they believe that it will increase the amount of pro bono if lawyers are either obligated or will voluntarily uh, report the amount of pro bono that they have done. Uh, this is something that, uh, that was proposed in Colorado back in 1998. The, uh, the Judicial Advisory Council of the Colorado Supreme Court in 1998 uh, proposed um, uh, uh, mandatory pro bono reporting. Uh, but uh, the Bar Association uh, was, was not impressed. Uh, and they claimed that it would amount to indentured servitude. Uh, they claimed that it was a slippery slope uh, to taking us to mandatory pro bono, uh, and uh, so it uh, it died. Uh, now, uh, is it time to take another run at it? Uh, perhaps. Uh, this could be accomplished uh, uh, when you file your registration statement. Rule 227 requires that you answer certain questions uh, when you register each year. You have to answer the questions about child support. You have to answer the question about whether or not you have malpractice insurance uh, and, and so forth. Uh, this could be another question uh, that, would, uh, that would be on there. Uh, right now, we don't have that. Uh, and the question is, uh, should we? Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about where we are. Um, number one, uh, I think it's it's pretty clear that uh, most of uh, folks in uh, in the U.S. that uh, that need legal help aren't getting it. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Isles and uh, and the uh, and the Hague uh, Institute, uh, uh, their study shows that the United States ranks 30th out of 37 high-income countries uh, for civil justice. And it ranks 22nd uh, out of those same countries for criminal justice. Um, consumers can, cannot find legal help uh, that's affordable. And lawyers feel constrained uh, by rules that prevent them from connecting with uh, and serving clients. So whose problem is this? This is our problem. We're the ones that have the monopoly. And uh, uh, so what are the risks of doing nothing? Uh, if we don't take it upon ourselves, uh, somebody else is going to do it. They're out there right now. Uh, and there are, there are many uh, companies, organizations that are, are uh, devising ways to provide legal service without using lawyers. Rocket Lawyer, for example. Uh, is one. There are many others. There's there's something called Modria that will that will provide uh, a way to mediate a dispute online. No lawyers required, and uh, they'll mediate the dispute, give you the uh, give you the uh, the uh, answer as to uh, how the dispute should be resolved, and that's that. Uh, who should bear the costs of? Uh, of closing the justice gap. Well, right now, um, it's borne by us. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court's 
regulates the practice of law in Colorado. The attorney regulation system is funded by you and me. There's no money from the legislature, not a dime. Uh, and so should we be the ones that, uh, that resolve the justice gap? Uh, or should, should we look uh, uh, to, uh, to other sources as well? Um, we need input uh, to answer some of these questions. Uh, we need uh, input from other providers. Uh, we need input from the public. Uh, we need them to tell us what it is that they need. So uh, I have a few questions for you. Uh, we're going to do a little polling here. And uh, I think uh, Georgette has told me that if you go to CU, CU law backslash ethics. Is that right, Georgette? CU dot. CU dot law backslash ethics. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Okay. We're going to have our students ask it. Okay. Sean. So, uh, question is Have social impact bonds been explored to fund access to justice? I, I'm, you're going to have to say that again a little louder. Sorry. Uh, have social impact bonds been explored to fund access to justice? I'm not sure that I understand the question. <laughs> um, so I, I think what you're asking is, what is the, has anyone studied the social impact of access to, of uh, the need for access to justice? Is that the idea? A bond or a, or a municipal bond. Oh. Yeah, the, the, a funding source. Yeah, to use the bond oh, oh, as a funding oh, oh, source. I see, I see, okay. All right, well, uh, I suppose that's a possibility. Uh, you know, in this state, that's going to require uh, uh, someone to get out there with a uh, petition uh, and to get it on the ballot, right? Uh, and uh, uh, you know what happened uh, this, uh, this past election with regard to uh, uh, tax measures? They all went down to defeat. So I don't know whether or not that's, uh, that's a viable option. Um, but, um, Georgette, can we, uh, uh, can we uh, put the uh, questions up on the screen? Is there a way to do that? Yeah. See you, see you law backslash ethics. Yeah. legal services type approach, et cetera, seems to be interest and no interest. So so what's your vision of how the law schools fit into this whole solution dynamic? Well, I, you know, I, I think that the, that the law schools have to play uh, a significant part. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the good news is that people get used to doing pro bono in law school. Um, you know, there are there are many legal clinics that you can uh, you can participate in. And, and I think that we need to do even more of that. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what else we can do uh, other than that. I, I think that, uh, that we have to include uh, not just the law schools, but the law students uh, and, and give them a seat at the table and let them tell us what they think they need. Uh, hopefully uh, that will do it. So Georgette, can, there we go. All right. So, um, is this the first question, Georgette? Yes. Okay, so, do you provide pro bono services? Everybody says yes, but we only have five responses. <laughs> Raise your hand if you do any pro bono. And, and those of you that don't, um, why not? Not enough time, worry about malpractice insurance. Uh, what is it? Um, all right. 
You know, there are most, uh, I, I know that some lawyers will say, well, you know, I'm worried about getting sued. I'm worried about malpractice. Uh, and uh, certainly there, there have been some claims that, are, that have been made against lawyers doing a pro bono case, but most pro bono providers provide malpractice insurance for the lawyers that are doing the work. So even if you don't happen to have malpractice insurance, the pro, pro bono provider probably has it. Metro Volunteer Lawyers has it. For example, a, a, number, of, a number of others have it as well. So uh, I don't think that's a good reason not to, to provide pro bono. Um, so if you provide pro bono services, how many hours uh, per year? 50% um, say uh, they, they satisfy the, uh, the aspirational goal of 50 hours. Some, uh, some, less, uh, some less than that. Uh, do you believe there should be a mandatory minimum uh, pro bono service hour requirement? Um, and and uh, I see that uh, 13, uh, 13 responses, uh, and we have 64% say yes. Um, if there is a mandatory pro bono service requirement, uh, should attorneys have the uh, option of buying out uh, that obligation? You know, there are some states like Florida where you can give uh, you can give a certain amount of money to a pro bono provider or to the bar association, and that will satisfy your pro bono requirement. Uh, a friend of mine, Dan Tobman, who is uh, a senior judge on the Court of Appeals, wrote a very interesting and provocative ar ar article in uh, DU Law Journal, uh, where he proposes uh, that, uh, that one way that a lawyer could satisfy uh, his, uh, his or her uh, pro bono obligation uh, would be to, uh, to pay uh, the uh, amount of money, 50 hours times the hourly rate that the lawyer has and pay that amount of money uh, to a pro bono provider. Uh, for some of us, uh, that might be uh, a small amount. Others, uh, it might be uh, it might be quite a bit. Uh, whether that's whether that's something uh, that uh, uh, that we should do. Uh, good question. So um, let's go back to that for just a moment, uh, Georgette. See what people think. Um, uh, quite a few think yes. And so if we did that, who would the money go to? Would the money go to the court? Would the money go to Colorado Legal Services? Would it go to the Legal Aid Foundation? Who would it go to? Unclear. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that's, that's at least a possibility. Um, where pro bono service is voluntary rather than mandatory, should lawyers be required to report uh, those pro bono hours to the court. And uh, it's a fairly even split here. Um, is there anyone that would like to, uh, to uh, tell us why they don't think that lawyers should have to report? Anybody that would like to tell us why they think uh, we should report? Well, I think that, uh, that if we reported, uh, that uh, more people would do pro bono. Uh, I don't think they'd want to they'd report a goose egg in their registration statement. Now, you know, maybe nobody else is going to look at that, but, uh, uh, you know, lawyers are competitive. Uh, and uh, I think the last thing uh, that you would want is for uh, there to be some record that I did zero hours of pro bono service last year. Um, all right. Do you participate in the uh, pro bono recognition program? Everybody says no. I'm amazed. Pardon, pardon me? OK, I'm amazed that, uh, that you don't participate. You should. I mean, it's easy. Uh, and you, know, you get a little certificate. Um, 
Uh, I think that Neil's firm probably participates. Uh, my firm participates. Most law firms of, of any size participate in the pro bono recognition program. Uh, and the way that it works, of course, is it's on, it's on the honor system. Uh, nobody's going to audit uh, your timesheets. Nobody's going to, uh, uh, to check to see if, if uh, what you've reported is actually true. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, I, I think it's something that, that, uh, that is worth doing. Um, so uh, do you keep track of your pro bono hours in the same manner that you do for a paying client? Um, less than half say yes. So if you don't keep track of your pro bono hours, how do you know whether you, you uh, did your 50 hours or not? And if you don't keep track of your hours, why not? I, don't, you, don't you treat a pro bono case the same way that you would treat a, uh, a paying client? If you don't, you should. Um, you know, these folks uh, deserve the same kind, kind of service uh, that, uh, uh, that paying clients uh, uh, require. Now, um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is a little different uh, question, and this really has very little to do with uh, access to justice, but I wanted to, I wanted to ask this question because uh, this is something that is being considered. Um, whether or not uh, we should require malpractice insurance in Colorado. Right now, there are only two states in the country that require malpractice insurance. Everybody know that? Does everybody realize that lawyers in Colorado are not required to carry malpractice insurance? Anybody not know that? Is, is that a surprise to anyone? You're surprised. Well, it's true. And and of course, if you, if you walked up to John Q. Public on the street and asked them, do lawyers have to carry malpractice insurance? They'd all say, yes, of course. You know, just like my doctor has to carry it, right? But we don't. We don't have to carry it. So should we be required to carry it? And here we have uh, a little bit more than half that say yes. Um, if it's not required, um, should lawyers be required to report their malpractice insurance status to the Supreme Court? Well, we do that right now, right? We have to say whether or not we have malpractice insurance. Um, there's no penalty if you don't, but uh, we have to require that. So if it's not required, should lawyers be required to disclose their lack of malpractice insurance in writing to their clients? Some states require this. Uh, California requires it. Um, South Dakota requires it. And it's, it's weird in South Dakota. South Dakota requires that the disclosure be on the lawyer's letterhead. And so every piece of correspondence that goes to the client has a disclosure that says, I don't have malpractice insurance. The lawyer has to have two forms of, of letterhead, one form that he sends to clients and the other form that he sends to everybody else because he doesn't have to disclose it to anybody but clients. Uh, but there are, there, are, there are a number of states that require that disclosure. Uh, and of course, uh, there are some there are some uh, risks if uh, if uh, if you don't uh, disclose. Now in California, if you don't disclose uh, about malpractice insurance, your fee agreement is not enforceable. And there is a there is a well known case in California where uh, it was a class action, and uh, there were a number of lawyers that were involved, and they were all participating in the case. One lawyer had referred it to another lawyer and so forth. Well, one guy didn't have malpractice insurance and he didn't disclose it. Uh, and he was unable to collect his $2 million that, were part, that was part of the fee. Uh, so uh, 
uh, at least in some states, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty heavy penalty. So how many people carry malpractice insurance? Um, okay, some do, some don't. Um, so in Colorado, um, most people carry malpractice insurance. Uh, we have Rule 265 in Colorado. And Rule 265 is a rule that encourages malpractice insurance for people that practice uh, with more than one lawyer. So if you have two lawyers or more uh, and you have either a, a partnership, uh, an LLC, an LLP, anything of that sort, Rule 265 says that you don't have uh, individual liability for your partner's torts so long as you carry a minimum amount of insurance. And Rule 265 requires, I think, $2 million of insurance in the aggregate and uh, $500,000 per claim. Uh, not a huge amount, but, but uh, sufficient. So, so that's Rule 265. So anybody that practices uh, in some form other than a solo would be crazy not to carry malpractice insurance. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about this from one end. Yeah. Have we talked about it from the Supreme Court going through all their rules and figuring out which of those rules increase the cost of litigation unnecessarily? For example, county court rules now allow for depositions for a $25,000 case. Was that designed to increase or decrease the cost of litigation? Yeah, that's, We yeah. haven't raised small claims court limited jurisdiction in years. County court, we now allow motions practice for a $25,000 case. Was that designed to increase or decrease? I mean, I see rules coming down the pike every day that simply increase the cost of litigation and therefore the cost to clients because they put more demands on lawyers, more possibilities of making mistakes and more costs. And we seem to only be approaching this to what lawyers need to do to solve the problem versus what the courts need to do. Okay, well, no, I, I think you make a great point. And there, there are some folks that are looking at, uh, at modifying the rules. Uh, for example, uh, rule 16.1, uh, which is uh, a rule that governs, um, uh, governs uh, uh, divorce cases that are, uh, are uh, uh, low asset divorce cases. Uh, and I think there is a move afoot to not allow any discovery in that, but rather require disclosures. Uh, so th that, you know, that would be an answer, I think, uh, to your question about depositions, for example. But you're right. And, you know, I, I would encourage you to, um, to contact the Rules Committee, the Civil Rules Committee. Uh, and that is a, a committee of the Supreme Court, uh, it, is made, it is made up of one Supreme Court justice and then uh, regular practicing lawyers around the state and tell them what you want. Uh, tell them what, how the rules need to be changed. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, you'd be surprised at, uh, at the reception you would get. Okay, licensed legal paraprofessionals, LLPs. Do you favor such a program? Most do. That's great. That's great. I'm, I'm surprised at that, uh, but uh, that's, that's great news. Do you view it as a threat to your practice? Most say no. And let me just say one thing about that. The people that LLPs would be representing are people that you're not representing. These are not folks that, uh, that uh, are choosing between uh, you and, and an LLP. These are people that are choosing between nothing or an LLP. That's, that's the folks that we're talking about. This is the 75% that are trying to represent themselves. And there are a few, in that 75% that have the money to hire a lawyer and they just 
stubborn and they don't want to do that. But for the most part, uh, it's, uh, it's otherwise. So what tasks should these LLPs be allowed to perform? Um, full representation, um, 65%. Negotiation and mediation, um, 85%. Sit with the client, but make no argument or, or offer evidence, 50%. And let me say that uh, right now the proposal in Colorado is that these LLPs could go to court with the client, could sit with the client at counsel table, but could not speak unless the judge asked a question. Um, these people could, uh, could uh, counsel their client, could tell their client what's going on, could uh, offer advice to the client, but couldn't make argument, couldn't offer evidence, couldn't try the case. Uh, and, and frankly, most of these people uh, would be handling cases that settle, not cases that go to trial. What kinds of uncomplicated cases should they be allowed to handle? I see evictions at uh, 90% family law 60, and so forth. It's interesting. The first time we made a proposal to the court, we proposed that it be just for evictions because we saw that as a crying need. The court said, I think we want to go back and look at the 75% that try to represent themselves in domestic cases. Let's focus on that instead. And so, and so that's the direction that, that we're headed right now. So. Um, this, is, uh, this is interesting. Th this information is something that I'm going to take back to the, uh, the folks working on uh, LLPs. Uh, and uh, and uh, I thank you for, uh, for giving us that information. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks for being here today. And, uh, and uh, please uh, think about the justice gap and think about solutions to the justice gap. Uh, if you're so inclined, um, uh, make a contribution to the law school. Um, uh, make a contribution to one of its many endowed scholarships. Uh, Mark Fogg and I have been uh, heavily involved in a scholarship for uh, uh, s someone who was our mentor for many years, Brooke Warnicke. Uh If you wanna make a contribution to the Brooke Warnicke Scholarship, please do or any other scholarship at the law school. Uh, and, uh, and finally, go Buffs. Thanks. <laughs>